I know that a lot of you audibly gasped when I changed my profile picture on Facebook, saying that I was giving up Facebook for Lent this week. Several of you called to ask if I was okay. <laughs> I'm fine. Lent is a season in which we attempt to rid ourselves of a habit or behavior or crutch that separates ourselves from each other and from God. The traditional practices of Lent, of course, are prayer, doing penance, repentance of sin, fasting, almsgiving, atonement, and self-denial. Lenten disciplines provide a spiritual house cleaning to provide more room for God, a ridding of the clutter, yes? And I notice that Facebook feeds my anxiety about the fate of our country and planet. It feeds my fear, it feeds my insatiable hunger for connection, it feeds my desire to numb and avoid, it feeds my petty competitiveness, my workaholism, and my failure to observe the Sabbath. And most of all, my sinful tendency to see the world as us and them when I know it's only us. It kind of crowds God out. So I am currently stumbling around in a Facebook-free wilderness. I have taken up reading books and, you know, interacting with my children and my husband. <laughs> And I'm trying to pray more. It's my wilderness, right? And you have one too. It may not be that one, but you have one too. As we know from our Bible, Jesus was led by God into the wilderness, where he stays for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards it says he was famished. This is when the devil tempts him. When he's hungry, Jesus is in a state, I am sure, both mentally and physically of utter desperation. He hasn't eaten for weeks. He is likely hallucinating. He is probably thirsty. He's definitely tired and feeling empty and powerless. I imagine he feels as though he is about to die. Vulnerable and alone, gaunt and weak. He's probably even scared. And first he is tempted with food after all that time without, and Jesus says, one does not live by bread alone. And then Jesus is tempted with power over all the kingdoms of the world, and Jesus answers essentially, I worship God, not power. And then the devil tempts him to prove who he is, by throwing himself down. And Jesus refuses, saying that we should not be in the business of trying to test God or make God prove anything to us. We trust in God. And you and I are not Jesus. And so we are far more vulnerable to the devil's temptation when we are weak and tired and hungry and alone. And most of all, when we're scared. I remind us of this a lot because it is important to in these hot mess times. Studies show that when people are under stress conditions like anxiety, like the anxiety of losing wealth or status, like illness, like worry over the decline of the middle class, like poverty, like fear of terrorism or war, we are less likely to love the stranger. Do we not have a perfect storm right now? In other words, when you and I are in the wilderness of perceived powerlessness, we adopt xenophobic tendencies to fear those who are different from us, to scapegoat, to blame, to become more tribalistic, and surround ourselves with people we perceive to share the same values and the same characteristics as us. That feels safer. 
We are most vulnerable to being tempted by the devil when we see the world in terms of scarcity rather than abundance. When we see people in the world as objects to be feared rather than as God sees us, as beloved. And yet Jesus reminds us, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him, which as we know means simply this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And beloved, like everyone else in this country, we have been tempted by the devil to hate and despise our neighbor based on their political persuasion, based on their religion, their immigration status, their skin color, their gender, their sexuality, especially this year. And we have refused to take the bait. We have consistently said no to the devil, and yes to love. Again and again, beloved, we have chosen love. And together, we are practicing the Lenten discipline of giving that love away. A few weeks ago, for those of you who are new to us or weren't here that day, you should know that we were given a reverse offering. I gave you all $5,000, and I told you to use it for good, to share the love, to come back, and to tell the story, right? You remember this? It wasn't that long ago. Some of my leaders and colleagues were surprised that I was willing to trust all of you without any kind of direction other than use the money for good, right? It was an act of faith in you and also in God. And I didn't question for a moment that that money would go to God's glory. Raise your hand if you participated in this challenge, just so we can get an idea. Yeah, a lot of you, most of you even, right? So I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them the story of what you did with the money in two minutes or less. <laughs> and um, and if you didn't, if you didn't participate, you just get to listen. So I want you to find somebody, regardless of whether you participated, so that you can hear from them what they did with that money. Okay? Just do just do that right now. Syrian refugee family, for the First Church Deacons Fund, for grocery cards for the First Church to distribute to people who are hungry, 
for Smile Train, an organization that helps children born with cleft lips and palates, for UNICEF, for the Sterling Animal Shelter, for the LGBTQ Asylum Support Task Force at Haddon Park UCC in Worcester, for the North Central Mass Chapter of the National Alliance for Mental Illness, for the Maxwell Baker Foundation for Addiction and Recovery in Memory of Sterling resident Max Baker, who's just 23 when he succumbed to this terrible addiction. For a child who never has money for lunch at Clinton Elementary School, donated anonymously into the child's lunch account by her teacher. For two flocks of chicks through Heifer International, sent to families and locations around the world learning about good farming techniques. Right, Pat? That's good. To help the Standing Rock Sioux, working tirelessly to protect our land and water from the Dakota Access Pipeline. To Birthday Wishes, an organization that provides birthday parties to homeless children in area shelters. To a New England organ bank in honor of a close friend who is awaiting a kidney transplant. To the One Spirit, a nonprofit Native American organization founded to assist and support American Indians. To buy 10 pairs of warm socks for a nurse's cold, homeless, and elderly patients who come as patients into the emergency room. To the Rutland, Vermont, Syrian Refugee Resettlement Program. To the Just Cause three-day cancer walk. To Sterling Light Department's Neighbor to Neighbor Program. For fidget items for a teacher's special needs students. To the Source of Life Orphanage in Haiti for socks, more socks, for the Worcester Fellowship Homelessness Ministry, to surprise firefighters at the grocery store. <laughs> when they said, oh, I can't take that money, Betty said, you don't understand, my pastor told me I had to give it away. <laughs> the power. <laughs> One of our children, Tommy, gave a Duncan's gift card to every person he saw in a barber shop, parking lot, and a local car wash saying, I want to spread the love on Valentine's Day by giving you this card. I know, it's so sweet. And one of, uh, one of the men that he gave a card to gave him money to buy more cards so that he could give more away. Spreading more love. Judy and Julia purchased a Valentine's bouquet for an elderly woman delivered by 10-year-old Julia. Do I know you, the woman asked. No, Julia replied. Mom and I just thought it would be fun. <laughs> and hugs and squeals of delight ensued. Jennifer shared her family's money with one of her co-workers who frequently uses her own money to buy clothing and other needed items for the patients in her program. Kim does this all the time, she says, only because she wants to help others in need. She helps others, and I wanted to help her out this time. John decided that his $25 would be loaned by Akiva.org to Tatua, an unmarried woman with two children living in Samoa, who is looking for a loan of $400 to stock her local canteen in order to make money to pay her weekly living expenses. John decided to do this for the rest of the year. And the quote he saw, uh, Kiva spoke to him, dreams are universal, opportunity is not. When I went to the young adult gathering two weeks ago, Dave said that if he had been at church that Sunday, he would have found someone here with the opposite political views as him and invited them out to lunch to really listen and to hear. Don't you love that? Talk about making more room for God. You reported feelings of amazement, gratitude, excitement. You reported that this gift was freeing and burdensome <laughs> and joyful. And some of you gave it away impulsively as soon as you got it within hours. And some of you agonized over the decision for weeks. Some of you are probably still agonizing <laughs> over the decision. One of you said that it was the hardest that I have ever thought about how to spend a small amount of cash. Many of you said that the challenge was meaningful for you and for your children. Many of you said it created in you a desire to do more. Many of you matched the gift, doubling or tripling it. 
Some of you pooled money with family and friends. This money, this love has been spread and spread all over the community, all over the country, all over even the world. Isn't that amazing? Lives have been changed by this money, most especially for the givers. Amen. I told you after the election that we were made for such a hot mess time as this. Do you remember that? I told you that the day after the election. And this is why. This is why. We choose, instead of fear and hate, to infect the world with our love. To give it away. Away with you, Satan, we say. At First Church, when we are faced with the devil's temptation to dehumanize and destroy, our response is this. Hope, not cynicism. Abundance, not scarcity. Sharing, not hoarding. Understanding, not demonizing. Love, not fear. Amen. Steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord, our psalmist says. Giving away this money was an act of trust in the Lord, that is love. It was an act of trust that love would guide it. It was an act of trust that love would work magic on the giver and the receiver. It was an act of trust in the law of love. This lens. Choose that kind of trust in each other and in God. This Lent, let us continue to deny the devil a foothold in our hearts. Let this giving be only the beginning of something far more big and bold and beautiful. Love the hell out of this world.